Okay, so I think we'll get started for today. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nadine Hassan, and I'm the Public Programs Assistant here at the Museum of Anthropology. I'm very excited to be opening this discussion today. Uh, welcome to our fifth event under the series of Artists Unscripted. By the way, you can see all of our episodes afterwards um, on our website as well as YouTube channel. So this episode will also be made available on YouTube and our website. The theme for today is Benin Reimagined, and we've organized this event as part of our programming for the exhibition Sankofa, African Routes, Canadian Roots. I would firstly like to start off this event by acknowledging that MOA is on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Moreover, I would like to emphasize that land acknowledgements are a way to incite a call of action. I'm very excited to be here with such accomplished artists from our Sankofa exhibition, Peju Laiwola and Victor E. Kameno, as well as our co-curator, Titilopi Salami. And they're all joining on from different time zones, <laughs> from Cologne, Germany, from Lagos, Nigeria, and from Ghana as well. I'm so delighted that they'll be sharing more about their works, um, but also engaging in some very interesting critical discussion about the cultural heritage of Nigeria, addressing repatriation and the current situation of arts today. So for today's discussion, I'll actually be more taking a back seat, but Titilope Salami will be our host and um, I'll be managing more the tech side of things. So please let me know, um, send a message in the chat. If you have any te technical difficulties, uh, feel free to let me know. Uh, also, if you have any questions or comments for our presenters, there is a Q&A function at the bottom where you can write your questions and we'll address that in the Q&A portion at the end. All right, so uh, I will quickly introduce our lovely host today, Titilope Salami. Titilope is an artist, curator, and lecturer of visual arts at the University of Lagos, Nigeria. Her group exhibitions include Jubilation, Diversiform, Strength of Women, and On and On. And she participated in the performance Red Day with Jalili Atiku. Salami is currently conducting her PhD research in the history and policies of West African museums at UBC. All right, so Titilope, take it away. Thank you very much, Nadine, for that very wonderful introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm Titilope Salami, and I'm so glad that Sankofa has finally opened. And thank you to everyone who has gone to the Moa to see the show. If you have not gone to see it, please go to see it. You will love it. So without wasting our time, I'll just go ahead and introduce our artists, our honorable artists who have decided to join us and to teach us, lecture us, talk to us about their practice and about a lot of things about Bini, about Nigeria today. And I'm super excited to have you on this program. Thank you very much for honoring the call. So first I would like to introduce Professor Kweju Laiwala. Professor Adik Bejulai Ola is an artist and professor of art history at the University of Lagos and also runs two artist platforms in Lagos, Nigeria, Women and Youth Art Foundation and Master Art Classes. Our research, writing and artistic engagements have consistently engaged themes of artifact pillage, restitution, history, memory and the artistic trajectories of African and diaspora artists. She has published several articles, both locally and internationally, and at several exhibitions, including her most referenced solo show, Bini1897.com, Health and the Restitution Questions in 2010. She is the president of the Art Council of the African Studies Association, Akasha. Thank you, Professor Kweju, for, for you know, agreeing to talk about your work today. We really appreciate it. I'd like Nadine to show Professor Kweju's work in the show. And then after that, I'd like you to talk about your work and your practice in general. Thank you. I believe everyone can see the video. Yes, we can see it. Thank you so much, Titi Lope. You're welcome. 
Do I start now? Oh, after this video. Okay, so it's a good work. Thank you, Nadine. So, Professor Kweju, I would like you to talk briefly about your practice and, you know, especially your work in this show. Okay, thank you so much. What a great honor to be part of this show. Uh, I would like to start by, you know, make a reference to the work that's in the show. And perhaps just talk about what I do as an artist uh, based in Nigeria, based in Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, this work titled Dialogue in Serious, uh, I made it in South Africa. I was invited to take up a residency at Rhodes University in Grahamstown, South Africa. And it was a residency for artists and writers uh, known as RAW under the auspices of the Arts of Africa and the Global South Research Program. And so this work became the high point of my solo exhibition, which was titled Return. So I went into South Africa without a preconceived notion of what I was to do. I actually wanted the uh, city to speak to me, uh, Graham Stout. And uh, this visit was particularly instructed because Graham Stout symbolizes the continent's common history of oppression and subjugation. And this small town had carefully preserve the relics of this ignoble past. Um, so in Grahamstown, the common African history of oppression, subjugation and, and uh, dispossession symbolically returns to, and uh, returns in quotes to hunt both the victims and the victimizers in very significant ways. So I also looked at the contemporary framing and presence as a town of significant cultural diversity, which spoke to me. Uh, in many ways. Uh, so I looked at uh, the story of Sarah Batman, um, the Koshan woman who was taken from South Africa to, the, to Britain and then to France and kept in human zoos, she was dehumanized. And so I looked at that story and tried to present it in a way that uh, would not expose her to the European gaze that put her in that kind of predicament in the first instance. So I was also looking at the larger picture of my work as an artist that has focused a lot on um, the historical episode that happened in 1897 in Benin when British soldiers attacked the city and cutted away thousands of um, Benin treasures. So for me, I was looking at this history of the return of uh, Sarah Batman's body um, which was uh, brought back to Hanke, um, where she was finally buried. Uh, I think it was when President um, Mandela became president that he asked that the, you know, the entire body, the body parts that were kept um, you know, in the laboratory for several, well, in the museum for several uh, decades should be returned to South Africa for proper burial. So what does this mean? I was also looking at the trying to establish that, that there was a widespread expropriation, not just in Benin City that had been plundered, but also if you talk about artifacts, um, Benin treasures, human remains, and we also know the story, the very popular story of um, the, the uh, clamor for the return of human remains from, from Namibia as well. So I looked at all of this as a broad, um, story or history of expropriation, whether you're talking about human bodies or remains or artifacts. So in that work, Sarah Batman is not very visible. Uh, I try to create her in a way that you don't see her clearly, but she's actually sitting on her head. She's uh, upside down, placed upside down. I didn't want to expose her again, you know, for people to look at her and identify her by just looking at the work. But all around her, we have um, images of expropriated art from um, the Ashanti region, which was also plundered, and then the Benin artifacts and a lot of icons from Ethiopia as well. So you find the Ethiopian crosses, the Coptic crosses, manuscripts are all part of the iconography that you find on, on that work. So in a nutshell, um, this is an extension of the work that I've done over the last several decades, three decades, 
uh, I had the first solo exhibition that is, uh, you know, the first solo exhibition that focuses on uh, the history of Benin in relation to the attack in 1897 in 2010. And subsequently, I'd had other projects like the Who Centenary Project, which was in 2014, for which I invited um, 10 other artists, including my mother, Princess Elizabeth Olou, and Victor A. Kameno, and a few other artists to take part to vent that project and, and to add their own ideas to uh, extending the beauty that we find in the culture of Benin City. So I grew up in the city of Benin, and it's a town that is very well known for the arts, not just the classical arts, but also contemporary expressions that are coming out of that city. And I studied at the University of Benin under the tutelage of um, Professor Irene Wamboje, who was um, you know, an art history, arts educationist and also a printmaker. He was actually the one that employed me at the university. And we had such great lecturers who made us realize the importance of our culture. And we began to draw from this um, repository of, of forms, of iconography, of you know, this rich resource in informing our art. So I'll stop at this point and then take more questions or allow Victor to also speak. Thank you very much, Ma. Um, so I remember when I interviewed you sometimes back in 2019 about that particular work, Sarah Batman, you told me something about commemorating our body, juxtaposing it with uh, one new clue and all of that. Perhaps you can talk about that much later. I just wanted to put that out. Maybe you would like to note it down. So going forward, I'd like to introduce Mr. Victor A. Kameno. I don't know, I think he just dropped nothing. Okay, yeah, he's back. Okay, so um, Mr. Victor A. Kameno is a Nigerian-born multimedia artist, photographer, and writer. Throughout his prolific career, he has produced abstract, symbolic, politically, and historically motivated works. He has exhibited works at numerous exhibitions and biennials, including the 57th Venice Biennale in 2017. He is the founder of Angels and Muse, a thought laboratory dedicated to promoting and developing contemporary African art and literature in Lagos, Nigeria. Thank you, Mr. Victor, for agreeing to join this show. Nadine, can you please show um, a shot of um, Mr. Victor's work in the exhibition and then afterwards we'll talk about his practice. Thank you very much. So Mr. Victor, can you please talk briefly about your practice as an artist and particular to the works in the show? Thank you to Zirakwe and uh, thanks to the Museum of Anthropology for putting up this show and inviting uh, me and other uh, great artists. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of the show. Um, I'm an artist. I'm also a writer as well. Uh, was born part of the Benin Kingdom, which is today's uh, uh, Edo, known as Edo State. Growing up, uh, I grew up in a village which is about, I would say about 30 minutes from Benin City as well, but Benin was our main place of coming to during holidays and all of that. And, and um, you know, which, which, was the, which was the city as well as, as he has always been for centuries, you know. So I grew up among, uh, artists in my community, you know, we have, uh, you know, 
have sculptors, we have painters, you know, but I grew up in a very large family. My grandfather's family and I had so many grandmothers that told uh, amazing stories uh, that always reference the royal family, that always reference the Oba, uh, the folk tales, the myth, and all of that. We revolve around the Oba and, and all of that. Oba as in the king of the kingdom, you know. So the kingdom was... Uh, kind of as close to us as the palm of our hands in, in, in our oral narrative, in our etymology, you know, and the things that we do. Uh, and this fuse and this kind of like seep into all the art making in the community as well, uh, in places of worship, in places of commemoration, in places of memorials, um, also known as shrines. Um, a lot of paintings, 2D, 3Ds uh, were very vibrant when I was growing up. Performance art was very vibrant when I was growing up and all of that. And all of these I consumed as a kid and kind of replicated them. And um, in performance art, I would mimic them, mimic the masquerades. And eventually I, I started drawing them. I started kind of like very fused into that whole at creative uh, system and uh, my uncle who is uh, 90 we say about with 89 this year right now was one of the earliest photographers as well that covered the Obas palace uh, uh, from the 50s late 50s just right after Alonge there's a photograph that himself and Alonge photograph of the in 1956 of when the queen uh, of England first visited the Oba, Obas palace and met uh, Oba Kenzoa you know so they have photographs from two different angles that were photographed. So my, my family, I grew up in, in this in a gallery situation or what you would call, you know, uh, for lack of a better word, a museum situation whereby we have images that are just poured in from 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 the past, you know. So I would consume all of these up until he left for the US to go study at the Institute of Photography in um, 1961. So growing up, by the by time I was now growing up, I had images that were coming from New York, from Germany, from all over the world, because he had traveled and photographed different things. I would hear of Harlem, I would hear of, um, of village and all of that. I would be so engrossed in them and all of that. He brought back also magazines like Ebony, Jet and all of those things. My uncle was actually in Harlem near the Apollo uh, in Harlem when uh, Malcolm X was killed. So he would tell us these stories, but as a kid, they never really like had that many until I started growing up. Then I traveled to America and they started taking root and the whole Bini tradition, I realized that I was born into a very, very significant world tradition that is just beyond my village, beyond Bini City. And it was actually a global situation that I was dealing with. And that has over the years, influenced my work and the way we talk about uh, a boy would talk about Benin work and I realized that you know every square mirror in Benin or every square mirror in the kingdom has an artist one way or the other you know so I, I happen to I am lucky and I'm grateful that I'm one of those that that happen to be just that one of those natural situations whereby um, you grow up and you just find yourself being an artist and, and you take up the mantle of being an artist and doing what you are supposed to do, you know. So in regards to the work that I'm showing at MOA, it, it's, it's one of those ways of showing that um, the kingdom is a living kingdom. It's not a static kingdom, as some people may want to believe that when colonialism ended, creativity ended in the kingdom. No, not at all. Every day we make new works, every day. We, 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 we kind of create new things when, when, when we, we are making, when the ancestors, when my ancestors were making uh, the bronze heads and all of that, they eventually like switched. When the white people start visiting and all of that, they started making, you know, referencing the white people with their, with their steel helmets and stuff like that, you know? So we have always uh, innovated. We have always like referenced the society. We have always been the mirror of the society and using the materials that we have but predominantly bronze, you know? So bronze is what the world knows, but you have to realize that there are other materials that were also used in the kingdom, you know? So you have to realize there were, um, you know, uh, metal works, you have woodworks and all of that. So I happen to kind of carry on that tradition of like, what is the next material that I can work with? And I realized that rosaries, uh, Catholic rosaries, which uh, I was born and raised a Catholic, but in a traditional setting, so I switched to using rosary to make some of my works in 2017. So the 
piece that I'm showing, one of the pieces that I'm showing, which is I am Queen Idia, Angel of Kings, is made from rosary. And uh, Idia is one of the uh, mother queen that we, we revere. And you will find the mask, there are about five of them that were part of the looted works from the Benin Kingdom in 1897. You'll find some of them in, in museums around the world. And yes, they were made from uh, different things, but predominantly from ivory. But I mean, nobody says that they only can be made from ivory. So I decided to kind of like imagine her as an angel that every king has worn around their waist uh, as a protective uh, uh, emblem. You know, so yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Victor. That was very enlightening. So I just go to the next question, and this is particular to Professor Kujilayola. I know you you probably have answered some of this in in um, talking about your practice, but I'm going to ask again, and maybe you can talk more elaborately. Ma, I have heard you speak about your upbringing in the Benin Palace a number of times. Can you talk about the influence of this experience in your practice? That's the first one. And the second one that is in a way related to this is that you have been very active in the discussion of repatriation. Your solo exhibition, Benin1897.com in 2010, which you also mentioned when you were talking about your practice, addresses this issue specifically. And your work in this show, Dialoguing Sarah, is about repatriation, yeah. I would love you to give your opinion on restitution of African art especially deleted objects from Benin. Oh, thank you so much, Titu uh, Dope. Um, first of all, I will start by saying that um, I was born in the palace of the King of Benin. Um, I didn't live in the palace. My mother, you know, was studying at the time at the University of Nigeria, Unsuka, and this was just at the onset of the um, civil war. And so her father, His Royal Majesty of Akenzo II, asked that all his children um, return to Benin to stay in the palace for safety. And it was during that time that she had me, um, you know, just at the point of coming out of the palace to go to the hospital uh, in front of the king. So for me, it's a great way of connecting with my heritage, uh, my maternal heritage. And so I also grew up with my mother, who is an artist. Uh, she is the first female bronze caster in Benin City. Her father gave her royal prerogative to cast in metal. So he told the head of um, one of the families that makes up the uh, Guild of Casters, uh, the Guild of Casters known as Igwemo. And so this chief, Chief Osa, uh, was told to open up his furnace, his foundry, and to teach my mother how to do bronze casting using the Serapeju technique of casting. So she, you know, for us, I mean, as a young girl, I saw her producing works, uh, working in different uh, media, but her forte was bronze casting. So I was privileged to be taught by, uh, you know, an artist while at home, even in secondary school where she was my art teacher, and also working with the new traditional artist uh, in Benin City, the bronze caster, the wood carver. So I grew up seeing Benin as, you know, an atelier. It was for me, the galleries were so much along the streets of uh, Airport Road, along the streets of uh, Mission Road. So these are things that were, that, you know, you know, built up the imagery that, you know, finally made me study art at, at the university. So, um, it became like second nature to think about how one can connect to this history and see how one can be very relevant coming from that kind of background. Um, and of course, as a young girl, we were told stories of the uh, plunder of Benin artifacts. And so uh, this was registered in our psyche. So it was something that one had to refer to as an artist. But even in school, we were told that we should return to the culture, take things that our predecessors had done and used them in ways that uh, will extend the ideas that uh, Benin is known for. So for me, the issue of restitution came up, the issue of uh, working on Benin as a major area of research, not just for my art, but also for my writing, came after I witnessed uh, an exhibition in 2007 in Vienna, uh, which was titled Benin Kings and Rituals, Court Art from Nigeria. And so I began to think about ways of responding to that exhibition because uh, it was very well celebrated in Europe, 
but it didn't come to Nigeria and there was nothing in the press in Nigeria that referred to that exhibition. So for me, I thought that I should do something that would draw attention to this historical episode and for us to address and discuss uh, these issues. And so I did my exhibition in 2010 and had it located in two different universities, University of Lagos and the University of Ibadan, where the work showed. Now, in terms of restitution, uh, it is heartwarming to see that things are beginning to uh, happen in ways that we plan them to be. Uh, many artists have been involved in this clamor. Uh, yes, my exhibition was the first that I attended to that in Nigeria, but they had had artists um, like film, uh, film producers and playwrights who had addressed this issue. It had always been in the realm of fiction. Indeed, we thought that this would never happen. And so from the very early um, request for restitution that was placed by my grandfather, His Royal Majesty of Akenzwa II in the 1930s, he was king from 1933 to 1978. But as early as 1935, he had requested for two um, uh, bronze works that were in the Berlin Museum to be returned to, um, to the palace because they were very uh, important in palace rituals. And it took uh, two years for plastic replicas to be made and sent to Benin and for which the king paid. Um, so for me, I think it's really heartwarming to see the changes that are occurring, that the world is beginning to think about uh, in, a, in a broader global context, about justice, about healing, about empathy, about repair, and that the return of uh, Benin bronzes is happening at this time and is caught up in this whole um, you know, discourse about um, reparation, about trying to uh, bring uh, to the world some kind of order and equity in dealing with uh, you know, people of uh, African descent. So just to round up by talking about, you, know, you, you took my mind back to the artwork that is in the show. And thank you so much for reminding me about the role that another professor, Professor Tobelo Yong Kong, if you look at that work, you find that I have an image of a woman. It's not very clear because Sarah Batman was the main figure I tried to highlight in that work. But Tobelo Yong Kong is a professor, a professor of chemistry and nanotechnology at the University of Rhodes University in Grahamstown. And she was a Lesotho cattle girl. Uh, became the phobia of African women scientists, very well known, very well recognized. So in my work, I try to put um, besides this story, the story of trauma of Sarah Batma with the story of success, a woman who had risen to the height of being recognized as a female scientist in South Africa. So what I tried to do in that work was to raise a commemorative cloth to celebrate her as well. So you have the Shoshwe cloth, which is known as South Africa. And so you see all the textures, very similar to uh, the Ankara cloth that you find in West Africa. So I raised this commemorative cloth to talk about the fact that South, South African women or Southern African women are also rising uh, and you know, distinguishing themselves in all fields of life. So the history of Africa should not be defined by trauma alone, but we should also put forward the stories that are defined that talk about women who are making their mark, their mark in society. And this is the work that does just that in the context of expropriation of objects that you find from all over Africa. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ma. Thank you. That's very elaborate. And yeah. thank you for making it very clear. So for Mr. Victor, I understand that we're having some questions in the chat already and we'll take that in the Q&A section. Thank you, Nino, for your question. So for Mr. A. Camino, I can still remember how passionately you narrated your experience as a child in Udomio Western. And I remember you also talked about it briefly in your introduction today. But I would like you to talk about how this experience has, uh, in a way, maybe influence your practice over the years and i also like you to talk about repatriation because i see that you you've also been very active in the discussion of repatriation and um you're also part of you know this new part of the um 
the fundraising team for this new museum, EMOA, that uh, they're planning of constructing in Benin. So can you talk about how you, uh, your experience in your hometown influenced your practice as an artist and then how this is related to repatriation and yeah, the subject of well, um, Thank you, Tisla. Well, I, I spoke briefly or kind of a little bit elaborately of, of my growing up and how that influenced my my art making and i mean now it's about remembrance for me like kind of like growing up what did i see what did i consume what did i um what has been wiped out what do i need to recreate you know so because sometimes memory can be a bit uh, flaky memory can be something that it's it's nostalgia for me is, is, is a driving force, okay? It's, it's almost like helium when, when I'm making my works, trying to capture what I what I saw as a, as a kid. So is that memory right? Is that memory true, you know? So, but I know that some of those things that still exist uh, seep into my work because I've seen when they were made. Some of them I've met when they were, uh, I've met some being wiped out now, uh, due to what you call development, whereby you know some shrines are are dilapidated because there is no more priest to handle the things that are supposed to be handled. Some of the ceremonies are no longer celebrated. Whereas when those ceremonies uh, or those festivals were about to happen, then that's when you really see art come to play because the, the shrines will be repented, new set of women we we come and uh, be commissioned to put new drawings on the walls of the shrines and stuff like that. And I will watch them, you know. Um, but those are what keep coming into my work uh, often enough uh, when I'm when I'm making works, you know. But when you talk about restitution, when you talk about you know asking for the work back, I'm glad that uh, Professor Pedro where I was here, I was I was one of the early uh, artists that actually like took exhibition openly to the to the to the to the center to the heart of Benin City when she uh, you know who's who's uh, centennial is it, you know so I think that was the title of the show that we all went you know, uh, to Benin, and we spent some days there, and I was lucky to have met uh, her mom, and she spoke energetically about uh, what uh, Professor Pedro just spoke about, you know, and other artists, you know, performing different things, walking in good streets, resensitizing that place, and all of that, just to kind of remind people that, look, there is there's something going on here, um, you know, and there is this cross-referencing that very wrong sometimes when um, people that don't know where some of the artists that are coming from, what are what their influence and inspirations are, they begin to cross-reference you with something that is completely far from it. You know, so you realize that there's something wrong because they sometimes can't make the connection. Seeing the works is different from where the work used to be. Uh, when I realize I, these histories are not pretty much taught in, in Nigerian universities because the history that we are left for us were written by colonials. And I don't think anybody will write how they have stolen from you or how they have pillaged or how have they, they have destroyed your culture. You know? So because of that, this history is very bereft. And even the language that is used, uh, you know, they call it the British uh, punitive expedition. And my question has always been, what did we do that they are punishing us? What did we, we didn't leave beneath. We were sitting, you know, my ancestors were sitting pretty and, and uh, having their uh, good old times when, when these foreigners came and just completely started their whole uh, program that didn't quite gel with, with uh, my ancestors, you know. So when I began to look at these things, I realized that a great injustice has been done in the past. And now that we can speak, uh, when Obavarame was given the treaty, he didn't write or read English. And that English, when you look at that treaty, you realize how disingenuous it was. It was, it was the most fraudulent document in history of business uh, uh, writing. If you study it MBA, you realize like it, if today's, you will be torn. But this was what they were holding on to, that this was what they were going to, when Dioba realized this was wrong, he, he, he kind of reneged on it, like any good business person would do. And that was what he was being 
uh, crucified for. You know, when I began to read these things deeply enough and everything, I realized injustice was done. And nobody will stand in the village square and watch his father be beaten and not raise a voice. So my raising my voice is that I've seen my father being beaten in the village square of, 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 of world culture. And um, that is where my voice is coming from. And again, I am not the one that started it. I'm glad that we are seeing the results now, like uh, Professor Pedro rightly said, this has been going on from the 1930s, you know. So, it's not like we don't know the importance of what has been stolen from us. We've always known, but the superpowers of the Western world has decided not to like pay attention to our cries. But now we can uh, we can raise our voice a little bit louder, and we have other collaborators that can say what is wrong is wrong, and we're beginning to see the result of that. I'm glad about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's, that's very great. Um, and I'm sure on questions. So I'll quickly go to my third question so we can take the Q&A. So the, another issue that is a little bit different from the um, discussion of repatriation is about authenticity. But in a way, we can still link it together because works were looted from Africa from Nigeria, and then we have contemporary artists who have still been making these works in the present time. So there's a this discussion of authenticity has been going on for a very long time. Esther Obeshi, who has also written, who have written articles on the subject. African art authenticity discussion is always accompanied with the questions of fakes, forgeries, and imitations, especially when we scrutinize contemporary religious objects. So now I would like us to talk as Africans, how do we address this, um, this issue as Africans? I'd like to hear from you, my, my professor and my guest in the art. <laughs> Thank you so much, Titi. Okay, authenticity. Uh, I will take it from maybe three angles. Uh, first of all, um, when you talk about fakes or forgeries, I think um, African arts, African arts can be seen to be, um, I mean, it's when, when an art form is done, uh, when an art is done and is true to its purpose of its creation, uh, it should be seen as authentic. And so, when you say that um, you have fakes and forgeries, I want to give the example of uh, the Benin bronzes. Um, during the period of the oil boom in, 19, in the 1970s, uh, there were a lot of people who came into Benin, expatriates, um, visitors to Benin who were looking to uh, buy some of the works that they had seen uh, in collections in Europe, in museums. And they traveled down to Benin to buy um, some of the Benin objects in bronze. And so it was, it was a period where the artists were making a lot of cast and they also thought that they could make much more money uh, from these expatriates or these visitors that were coming to Benin. And so what they did was to copy some of the classical bronze objects uh, with the intention of um, maximizing profit. And of course, uh, any work that was seen as commercially viable, like the um, the bronze heads known as Unlao. Okay, they made a lot of them. And they also tried to uh, fake the patination on them. So by painting them with animal blood and introducing them to oxides to make them look like antique. So that can come under that broad um, heading of fakes or forgeries uh, because they were made to deceive those who were you know, asking for them, who required, who wanted to have them as uh, memorabilia. But then you also have artists who would copy these classical objects, uh, even up to now. Uh, they do that because they want to go through the path that their predecessors have gone through. They want to reconnect with those, uh, their, their forebears. And so they will produce these works, not with the intention of producing them to sell and to deceive uh, those who want to acquire them, but because it was also a healing process for them, it was a way of connecting to the past. And I know that the title of this exhibition is Sankofa, uh, looking back to the past to inform the present and also make projections for the future. So in that wise, I would say that these were also authentic. But again, if you look at the, um, 
within objects, the broad range of object types, and the, you find that there are lots of duplicates. Um, you know, you have the head, one head in one museum, looking like another head in another museum, and several plaques that were also duplicates. So these uh, works were not, they're all originals in their own way. They're, not, they're all of, uh, authentic, if you want to use that word, uh, because they didn't come out of one mold. The uh, traditional casters that you find in Benin today may make exactly the same work, the same, another type for the same uh, image, but then because they don't use uh, silicone molds or plaster molds or whatever it is, the works are invested individually. They can be seen as, they can be taken as original works. So those works that are done with the intention of, um, you know, making copies to deceive can be looked at as forgeries or fakes, but I think that it is legitimate for them, for you to look at them as authentic. And indeed, I think that uh, many of the Western institutions are focusing so much on the classical art that it has taken away from the, the beauty and the very expressive works that are coming out of the, of the, of the continent from the, from the city itself. There's a lot that is being done in contemporary Benin. The contemporary artists are extending these ideas in different ways and are really bringing out very, very interesting works. And I think that you can also take those works as authentic. Thank you very much, Ma. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Victor has something to say to this because he just messaged that his network is unstable. But before that, I would quickly like to ask this before I forget. So I understand that um, a lot of work have been done in the contemporary time that have one relationship or the other with the classical art. But also when these works were littered, we still have this, um, especially the religious objects. We have the religions ongoing. I mean, some African um, towns, some villages did not stop in their traditional religion. We have different, you know, we have different shrines in the Yoruba land. We have different shrines everywhere. And there are still artists in each society, each community who continue to make objects that are still relevant to, to their community, that are still used as objects of worship. Because if the old ones are no longer available, at least in order for them to be able to, to worship. So can we then call these objects inauthentic? Because I mean, I, I mean, I've seen a lot of discussion where people talk about how classical art is the original, how you need to check a work that is far, far, that is dated as far back as pre-colonial period. And you know, any work that has, you know, a little bit of um, modern, you know, pattern or even color, they tend to rate that as inauthentic. Um, I don't know if you have something to say to that. Sorry, is it, are you asking Prof or me? I mean, my internet was kind of acting up, so I didn't know where it was. Oh, well, right. any of you can answer that. You can answer that. Uh, I want to. Well, quickly though, on the, on the issue of fakes and, on the issue of fakes and, and, and forgery, I mean, that is not very peculiar to, to, to African art. Or Benin art, to to say the least, you know. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a global. Uh, um, uh, uh, it is something that the world of art has to deal with and has dealt with over the years. Movies have been made, you know, of it in the Western world. We, we've not even made any movie of on on the fake art in in, a, in 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 my continent, you know. So I don't see that as a reason because I mean you have to also look at who is saying this and how is it been being uh, formed how is the how is the world being formed how is that narrative being uh, being created because you have to ask yourself that you have to realize that the work that we're taking in the colonial era are held in certain ways that they are canonized okay so if it's in the western museum is if it's owned if you can trace the 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 um, if you can trace the the history of of how the work was uh, first collected you understand you know so 
to 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 a white person to a, to a colonial master then it has more authenticity all right but i am saying that what about the works that we are not stolen when some of because it's not everything that they really looted from beneath right so if you pick one and you do a radio carbon on it and all of that the provenance of that work because they can't trace it to a white looter because they can't trace it to a colonial soldier that came british soldier that came to beneath and all of that and other parts of the country then there is that tendency to say oh we don't know where this is coming from oh this is probably fake you understand what i'm saying so that is where sometimes we have to look at the economics of art you understand because we are completely oblivious of that fact that there is the economic side of things to say okay who owns it about ownership you understand i know a lot of people are shaking in their boots right now because they like oh feel that when the works return to africa that they're going to lose their monetary value whereas it wasn't monetary value that was placed on some of the product uh, some of these art that were taken in the first place they were very uh they were they were very uh spiritual it wasn't about the money but money has come into the whole play right now so we are hearing words like fake we are hearing words like forgery okay fine if if a spanish artist paint contemporary work, is it going to be fake because it's not Picasso? I mean, at what point do we start kind of kind of like, you know, spinning this narrative that whenever anything comes out from Africa that is not created, that cannot be tied to colonial construct, that cannot be like authenticated by, uh, by a Western institution, then it's fake. You know, I mean, I, I don't buy to that. I don't subscribe to it because people have been creating. After 1897, works were created, okay? So what happened to those works? They are 120 something years old. By next year, it will be 125 year old. So are you telling me that if you bring a, 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 a bronze work that is 125 years old, it is not going to have the same value as some other paintings that were made in 1897 or in the 19th century? So we, we need to really like kind of like start changing even the narrative as, as, as far as I'm concerned, you know? So I, it doesn't bother me. I'm not, I don't know about fakes and forgery because it's, it's a living culture, it's a continuity. I mean, people we continuously made. And just before I stop, there are some of those objects we are not supposed, they were supposed to be ephemera anyway. They were not supposed to be kept. They, I mean, a funerary mask we are supposed to be used for a funeral and dispose of, of okay? So if you hold those things to ransom, that is not part of the that is not part of what we are doing right because when you when you create certain works in wood and they are destroyed and all of those things it give the next generation opportunity to create newer works right and there is a saying that when a, 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 a piece of mask or a piece of wood is no longer useful to its people they throw it into the fire and they burn it so that a new work can generate you know so yeah so when it comes to the issue of fakes and forgery um it's not peculiar to us. There will always be fake. There will always be forgeries, and you know, and that is not going to stop. Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, I we don't have enough time anymore to for me to ask more questions. So I'll just go straight to the Q and A. So Nadine, you can take the Q and A now if you're ready. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so I am also just going to shift to gallery view for everyone who's tuning in today. Uh, we have a question from Nuno saying, uh, firstly, I wanted to thank both Peju and Victor for their presentations and Titilope for the moderation. Uh, he continues to say, I would like to ask you what you think is important about memory and how contemporary arts can contribute to engage audiences with alternative histories. Isn't restitution a form of unlearning dominant narratives and proposing a recentered history? Can you comment, please? Okay, so I could, I could respond to this, uh, and I will take us back to the project I mentioned earlier, the Who Centenary Project in 2014. And this is how memory plays out here. Uh, memory is, is very much derived from history and in our iteration as artists, we decided to uh, look at the history of Nigeria, the amalgamation of the Southern and Northern Protectorate. And the Nigerian state was actually celebrating that uh, in 2014, it had a grand um, you know, uh, banquet and you know, celebrated this uh, event. But we thought as artists that we could look at history and what we intend to memorialize 
from history. And that was exactly the same, uh, the centennial year of the passing of Obavarawi, uh, who was exiled to Calabar in 1914. He died in 1914, and his son, His Royal Majesty of Erika the first took over the throne. So we thought that we could, on one side we had a history, and on the other side we had a memory of it, of the event. And so we were also looking as artists to look at the uh, site, the tourist site, uh, where the bronze casters live and work. So we went to Igun Street to have our iteration, and we have all the artists performing there, doing their various, uh, um, you know, um, arts and projects along Igun Street. So we also invited the brass casters. I mean, these are people who have been keeping the tradition going. Uh, if you if you talk about building today, uh, yeah, we talk about building bronzes, but those who have been, you know, um, casting and you know keeping the uh, the tradition alive are uh, actually living on the streets. And we felt that we could, you know, uh, also invite them to take part in our iteration. So for me, this was very important because sometimes look at these labels, the labels that we talked about earlier, uh, authentic, fakes, forgeries, uh, contemporary, traditional, classical. And sometimes these things blur, these uh, definitions blur in the face of uh, contemporary realities. So if you say that these are traditional artists, some of them, have gone to universities. Some of them have even worked in the universities. They've learned different other techniques of metal casting. And so we can't say, you know, in quotes that they are traditional artists. We, they are also contemporary artists as well, even though they are uh, meant to take part in major palace functions within Benin. So I would say that memory is very important. Sometimes memory is also colored by the present reality is sometimes not um, a rehash of history. It is um, sometimes even more uh, better color than history. Uh, it has a way in which it interacts with the present. It's not just about what had happened in the past, but also a reflection of what is going on at the moment. And Victor also mentioned the fact that um, the business society is dynamic. Yes, it has the ability to reinvent it itself. And we find this happening with the works of uh, contemporary artists who look at history as a form of, as a backdrop to their work. But in their various expressions, it's very different. Uh, his work, Iyoban uh, Yesigi, Queen Idia, using the rosary, also talks about the influence of Christianity. So it's not just about ancestral worship, using the rosary to represent the, the Queen Mother. It's a deviation from what happened in the, in the past. But this is an interaction with what is going on at present. And they're also making projections for the future. So th there's a way in which the artist um, is allowed, is given the license to extend his ideas and use history as a backdrop, but also, uh, also has the license to extend his ideas beyond imagination. Um, Mr. Victor. Would you like to say something to that or? No, really, I don't have much to add to that. That was quite uh, elucidating, you know, so I will, I will leave it at that. You know, so I know there is another part of the question which I don't really understand what the uh, what the no means by that, you know, like, I mean, isn't restitution a form of a learning dominant narratives and propose a recentered mm. history, you know, so I, I don't understand it so. I don't understand what she means by that. Sorry. Nino, you know, do you want to perhaps talk to ask the question more clearly? Or I don't know. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hi. Can hear you. Hello. No, I I just mean meant that um, people here tend to think of restitution as just uh, circulation of objects. And my, my question is to the center this from the objects and to think of memory and to think that what's at stake is not just a material thing. That was my, okay. the commentary I would like to, to have from you. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay. I, I, like, like I always said, sorry, am I? yeah, okay. Yeah, a lot of people uh, well, a lot of the uh, conversation surrounds the object themselves, you know. Um, 
but nobody has actually thought i mean there are a lot of labels that are written when you see an object when you see a bronze head in any of the museums there are you know sometimes you read them they are very off the point because what they are looking at oh it was made in 1870 something or in 16th century it's a power object and all of that what is power object you understand what i'm saying you know so when you take that kind of object to benin the first reaction to it in the first sighting of it they don't even have to like overstudy it and everything for it to have that uh, central meaning to them you know because it has it carries a lot of uh, weight beyond what you are seeing you know so again like you said we talk about restitution and we are talking about just object we are talking about the physicality of the object but we keep forgetting the emotional aspect of the of of the whole thing and and what this object had served in the past for the people uh, that they were taken from. They were part of our archival system as we have come to learn in the place where we always tend to think that everything is about oral tradition, oral history, but we keep to, we, we forget that they had a writing system that was quite visual, which was in the Benin Kingdom. You have the rituals, you have the ceremonies that were well documented using the most difficult object to create these things that is so easily understandable, whether in wood or in doors or in bronze or in, in you understand, you know. So in, in that, I am hoping that when some of these works actually come back to where they belong to, they will, they will have a, a kind of meaning that they are supposed to have because that tradition is still ongoing. You know? So I don't know if that answers your question, but I hope it does. Yes, in, indeed it does. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, in response to Nuno's question, <laughs> it brings another question to my mind, which is, uh, um, the question of authorship. So when we talk about restitution, learning and unlearning, and uh, and in something that is not written there that comes to mind is also globalization. How these subjects have been widely widely dispersed, and how um, we are kind of seeing them as uh, um, a worldwide culture. I mean, something everybody should have access to learn from. Something everybody should be able to to access and to reach. So then comes the question of authorship. So who, who really owns this subject? I mean, should they go back to their country of origin or should they stay where they are? If we put them online, uh, I, we make online um, documentation, who should have access to that? And who owns the copyright and all of that? I don't know, can the artist talk to that please? Victor, that's your call. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think ownership is if 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 ownership if we keep spinning this whole thing and we keep uh, you know when you are, when you are sinking you stop digging you understand you know so the the issue of ownership is is I mean you can trace the provenance of these works to a particular thing and and I'm I'm, I'm also very quick to let anybody that is willing to know that we're not asking for everything that was rightfully taken right, rightfully collected or purchased uh, you know to be returned you understand you know so but there was a history of 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 an attack there was a history of massacre there was a history of people's culture being decimated and burnt and everything and the way it was carefully documented so if you document it very carefully of where you took these things from professor dan hicks just released a document yesterday or this week specifying what they have in pitts river about 100 objects that can be traced directly to 1897. so who who owns it then you understand is it the people that stole the object is it the thief that owns the object or the owner of the objects where it was stolen from if you can trace it to where uh, it was stolen and professor sylvester but has also raised a question in one of his talks that i attended like when these things are digitized who owned the digital part of it you know this is like if you write a book about Benin bronzes tomorrow and you want an object from from say british museum who are you going to right to for copyright to use the that 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 piece you understand so this goes beyond because we look at the objects but we are not also paying attention to the digital ownership of the photographs that have been made from it books that have been written about it and all of those things that has become a huge commercial value for some of the museums that have retained these works and 
uh, that have like, have seized these works for the longest time. So the issue of ownership shouldn't even come up anymore because some of these things can be traced. You understand. And my next question, really, that I was going to ask is. When you look at some of these museums and all of those things, how many of the modernist works do they have? Those that want to retain, those that don't want to like send the works back that are saying that, oh, we want to teach the world uh, culture. We want to like be a place where people can come and learn culture. Did the culture stop in 1897 and other years that some of these things were taken? You understand how many contemporary or how many modern African artists do you have in your collection that is comparable to the amount of stolen works that you that you own and you retain and explain. So those are some of the questions that we should be talking about, not even the question of, oh, who owns the Benin bronzes when you can, it, the Obas Palace still exists in, in its all its glory. So I can speak for my kingdom, you understand, and a few other kingdoms. Of course, some of them have been decimated and completely didn't survive the British onslaught or the German onslaught or the uh, or, or, or the Belgian onslaught and all of that. You know, some of them did not survive it. You understand? Countries emerged, countries, new lines, new borders were drawn, and all of that. A lot of confusion was caused. So we have to figure a way how to untangle that. As far as ownership is concerned, the people that stole the work they carefully documented what they did because it was a sociological experiment. So we have to kind of reference those documents and know who owns what. Thank you very much. Thank I'd like you. to respond but, to that question okay. as well. Um, thank you very much, Titi. I think the, the point you raised about the universal nature of art, and I think that the bone of contention here is ownership really. And if ownership is established, even the building bronzes, um, restitution of some of the objects can you know, be done to be named, but some, some can still remain in the Western world. But there has to be a change of the narrative. There has to be a change of nomenclature and description. So instead of having yes. looted, looted objects, you now have loaned objects from Nigeria or from the, with the permission of the king, for example. Uh, so you don't have those objects as you know, bearing that mark of the stigma of being looted. Now you have, we recognize the ownership of, of the objects. And let us not deceive ourselves. There's a lot of money, a lot of revenue that derives from these, from these works. Oh, Over yeah. several decades, museums have been loaning, loaning works and they pay loan fees. Of course they do that. Uh, there's also uh, fees paid for copyright for the use of images. And I think one of you mentioned uh, the digital assets. We know now that we're having the uh, digital Benin project this is fantastic in the sense that we now begin to know the provenance of these objects and know where these objects are located around the world. I think it was Dan Hicks that said that we have about 161 institutions. I think he's even doing an update on the number of institutions that have the building objects in different parts of the world. And this is separate from even the private collection. So in that way, it is great that we get to know where these objects are, but then at the end of it all, who actually uh, has access? Is it gonna be an open access? Uh, kind of a digital um, archive who actually owns that archive because the images are derived from the physical work. And I think that's what Nuno was talking about, the physicality of the material. Who also owns that digital materials that derive from the documentation that is going on in many museums around the world. So that's also part, part of it as well. I think we should also take this into consideration in all of the discussions regarding um, restitution. Thank you very much, Ma. Thank you. So Nadine, over to you. Okay, wonderful. Well, uh, we are just going to wrap up for today, but I wanted to say thank you so much uh, to our presenters today, and thank you so much to Tito Lope, and thank you to everyone who came here today for this discussion. Um, for anyone, if you have not yet seen the exhibition, uh, Sankofa African Routes Canadian Roots is open and uh, on display until March 27th, 2022. So you can see uh, the works for yourself and engage with uh, all of these topics now having had this discussion. And just in general, uh, keep up with all of our exhibition programming that we have for Sankofa. Uh, so thank you so much to everyone for making it here today, tonight, this morning, <laughs> depending on where you're coming from. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you.
Thank you, everybody. Have a Thank nice you. one. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye.